Thank you, Senator Hassett. And Senator Langford, you're recognized for your question. Sure, thank you. Thank you all for bringing your testimony. Really appreciate your engagement. I was able to sit in earlier and be able to hear uh, your oral statements, and I'm back and forth in multiple hearings today. So I appreciate your engagement and your thoughtfulness on this. Uh, quick story, um, went to the National Archives, I don't know, several years ago, and I said, show me something that people don't get to see. And so they pulled out a, uh, a hand-done drawing of Pearl Harbor, uh, and it had X's on it and markings on it. And I said, what am I looking at? They said, this was a radar operator uh, uh, at Pearl Harbor that was tracking the Japanese coming in, and everywhere there's an X, it's when he radioed in and said to the folks at Pearl, I'm picking up a radio signal. And they signaled back, it must be people flying in from California. And there were like five X's, and then it stops. And uh, they said this document was highly classified for decades because it showed we knew the Japanese were coming and missed it. And so it stayed classified for decades. Here it is. It was an interesting dialogue, and it was also an educational moment for me to be able to hear classification and how it's used historically and how it can still be used today. My question's on a couple of things on this. There is a flip side of this. There are covert operations that do happen that protect our national security worldwide that some of them do last decades. And as long as we have that penetration, it stays classified. So if we do an automatic declassification in 25 years, that can threaten covert operations. But we also have the Pearl Harbor map that it's just someone trying to cover up their mistake as well uh, that's out there. So there are multiple layers of classifications. You've got sensitive, you've got classified, you've got top classified, you've got covert operations, you've got compartmented, you've got all these different pieces here. How do we strike a balance on automatic declassification and still protect covert operations that are still ongoing? Ready, set, go. All right, as the CIA guy, why don't I go first, or former CIA guy? Um, I'll, I'll go first here. I wholeheartedly agree with you, Senator Langford, um, which is why in the proposal that I have put forward, and I'll just talk about confidential human sources because that's also an area where I think the, the time scale can be similar to yeah, what you're you talking family, about. You've got family members that can be exposed. Even if that person's gone, their family's still around. That's, that's exactly right. So, you know, in my proposal, I'm focusing here on current confidential human sources. And by current, I mean whereby they have provided information on criminal activity, let's say in an FBI or other law enforcement context, or information of a foreign intelligence value within the last five years. Now, you know, if, if that's the case, that's going to get extended out for a very long period of time, so long as that's an active source. It's possible that we would need to talk about maybe just some tweaks to what I've you know, discussed here, but I think that kind of approach that recognizes that when something ends and there is no you know, life at stake, if you will, the information ought to be available in a much more timely way than it is right now. But I absolutely take your point with respect to covert action, and I wanna make sure that obviously we don't um, go anywhere other than the unclassified here. There are absolutely activities that take place that do stretch literally over decades, and we would want to make sure that those kinds of activities are protected. That being said, one of the cores of my proposal here involves an absolute prohibition on using the classification system in any circumstance to hide waste, fraud, abuse, criminal conduct, et cetera. And I think you need to have that in place because, you know, as, as Liza has indicated, and I have many examples that I can share with the committee, the classification system has been repeatedly misused to conceal those very kinds of things. Um, so that, that's my quick take on that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The solution that I have advocated for declassification involves removing multi-agency uh, equity reviews at the 25-year uh, mark, but not getting rid of the exemptions at that point. Uh, I have advocated having this steering committee, this working group uh, led by the White House, narrow those criteria because I think they're too broad, but certainly some of the examples you were giving, those would still be exempt from declassification. We just wouldn't have a multi-year endless process uh, and these open-ended exemptions that result in almost or not enough information being disclassified. Even the drop date, drop dead date that I mentioned, which is further on in time, 
uh, roughly 40 years is, is what I put forward. Uh, even at that point, there would be categories of information that should be exempted. Those would include confidential human sources and key design concepts of weapons of mass destruction. And there would be an option for agencies to seek case-by-case -case exceptions beyond those that could be approved by ICAP. Uh, but the key distinction there, again, is that the information would not have to be declassified if it didn't fall within one of these exceptions that I've mentioned, it would simply cease to be classified, and that's the key there. So uh, these solutions that we are talking about would absolutely preserve the government's ability to keep secret uh, the very narrow category of information that really does need to still be secret after 25 or 40 years. We have had a new designation show up recently on documents that get brought over to our staff. It has for official use only law enforcement sensitive. And the first time we saw it, we're like, what does that even mean? And this is not something that's in a skiff. This is just something that appears as a new designation. Magically, there is a new setting. And they're basically like, we don't want this out. So we're going to create a designation for this. Now, we have done what we should do with that. We've ignored that and said that's not a real designation on it. Uh, but th there's this constant push to say we're, we're not going to be able to get information out and we don't want to release out to the public on it. Uh, so we, we understand the challenge that we're on uh, dealing with any administration. I do really like the, the concept of having a place of appeal, basically. Uh, I don't know how many documents that we get that are redacted, that the whole page is black, uh, basically, with redactions on it, and we have no place to appeal to go fight for it. Uh, often we end up foying the documents, or some outside group does, and they get it, and we don't on it. Uh, that's absurd on it. But to have a place of appeal that's set up, what we were talking about before, would be helpful so we're not fighting an agency saying it's my document and I'll tell you what's classified and what's not. So, Mr. Fitzpatrick, you're leaning on the button like you want to say something. <laughs> no, I think um, you make an excellent point about the the, the realm of information control that happens outside of what we what is defined as classified national security information. And I was um, uh, 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 smiling at your words because there is not a defined meaning for FOUO, right? right. There are, and there was, a, this, again, to the point Liza made about the post-9-11 information share and connect the dots efforts that happened in the early 2000s, realizing that the challenge of too much information control uh, blinded, perhaps, uh, our ability to see this threat coming. Um, but but the, 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 the discovery of that as a problem, the study, rather, of that as a problem, revealed that there's, there's 118 different FOUOs, right? And then the, the uh, Obama administration, um, the Bush administration had some recommendations about controlled unclassified information. The Obama uh, administration had a different take that tried to... Um, limit the ability of a government agency to utilize a control like that and to make them more uniform. And what was discovered in that process, which was to say only agencies who have a law regulation or government-wide policy can put controls on information. If it says you can control this information, only you can do that. The, the number of times that that appears in uh, the in statute and regulation is far more than anybody thought, and the oceans of information that it covers is far more than anybody thought. And so it, what was hoped to be a limiting and a trans, transparency initiative actually uncovered this vast ability to control to more, or what could be controlled. And so the, it, it, it has not succeeded in, um, in releasing more information. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Langford. Uh, Senator